Okay, um, so let's start. Uh, I hope Christopher will come a little bit later, so he will. Um, we will share the lecture with him. Um, we are halfway through finishing the internal marking, so most of the assignments and the projects look look good. So it it is um, yeah quite good feeling that you get you got somewhere uh, and that the. Uh, the work that you've done is of, of good quality. So most of the stuff that we've checked already was clear pass and it's good. Um, the internal portfolio is worth 60%. So the internal portfolio kind of um, dictates the final grades. So it's good that it's, that it's good. Um, the exam is uh, an electronic exam. So we will talk a little bit about that. Um, and I will also talk a little bit about some of the things that uh, we will cover in the exam and we, we, what we covered in the course. Um, the final exam and you studying for the exam is part of the, is part of the um, curriculum, right? So it's not only the assessment, but it's also your way of upskilling yourself with those little things that you might have missed during the semester. So we treat it as a kind of a learning experience for you. So it's, you know, don't forget that it's not only exam in a sense that you have to be tested or assessed, but also an opportunity for you to learn things. And we have a heated debates with Christopher about <laughs> some of those aspects, for example, because uh, I still think you will learn a lot of things that you today don't know, but for the exam you will know. And that's of value, right? Even if it's not in the exam. And to uh, stimulate you learning those things, um, yeah, we will cover some, some of those areas in, in, the, in the lecture today. So um, what, what we will do is um, I will start with um, work. Uh, the slides don't work. So I will start with, uh, yes, um, with some of the um, mechanics related to the exam. Uh, first slide. First slide. Yeah. You want to say something? Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, just, um, uh, this is a, what is it? Few minutes lecture here, 45 minutes or something. Yeah. Right. So we will not cover the content of the entire course, guess what? Uh, <laughs> and, and make this subject to the exam. Of course, everything that has been said, taught, or you know, discussed will to some be to some extent relevant. Here, the point is more to highlight certain aspects you may not recall immediately anymore, or that are very central to the course, right? But it's by no means the delinea delineation. Don't take this slides at home and think, "Ha, hey, cool! I know the exam. Let's learn those slides by heart." That's not gonna cut it, right? No. Also, we assume that you didn't you didn't reset your brain after doing the assignments, right? So everything you did and learned about Go and, and you know aspects you learned uh, wh while doing so or that we refined and so on, you still, of course, should carry that knowledge with you. That's not something you need to learn for or look for. It's just to be aware that, you know, there may be, uh, well, su surprise, surprise, Go-related questions, right? So yeah. Uh, yeah. so the exam is mostly theoretical and mostly stuff that you need to kind of answer uh, outside of the assignments, but there are of course questions related to the assignments and related to the technologies that we've used and the Go programming. Uh, we've spent substantial amount of the course doing that, so some there are some questions related to that. Um, all right. Um, okay. So exam. So for the exam, I will go to the whiteboard. Um, give me a second. Right, so let's see. So the exam is an electronic exam. It's done in Inspera. If, you, if you've done Inspera exams, you will kind of know the gist. And Inspera allows us to do different types of questions. So we will have kind of a true false questions, for example. We will have the normal, traditional uh, multiple choice questions. And we will have uh, multi-select questions. So a multi-select question is that you have uh, check boxes, you have answers, uh, you know, some something, and then you have to tick combination of those things, right? Uh, and then the combination of those things creates a correct answer. 
Um, true false is easy. Um, it's usually done with the radio button. So one is true, one is false, and you pick one. Um, and then we may have some small uh, short answer questions as well. Uh, but majority of the exam is in this style, OK? Yeah, there are some go questions. Um, so for the multi-choice, uh, so before I, I start, I, I just um, ask you something. So if I have 100 questions, and I have true false questions, right? So I have um, true false, and it's 100 of them. And a person who takes the exam knows nothing and just randomly picks one of those answers. What's the score the person will get? So if a person knows nothing, what the person will get, yeah? 33%. How much? 33%. Why? Uh, because they select uh, more randomly per se than just 50 50. OK. <laughs> That's a that's an interesting one. So imagine that the person is perfectly unbiased and will select perfectly 50-50. Then how much? 50, right? So if, if each question is worth one point, the person who just guesses everything will get 50 points, right? If the person is guessing wrong, right? So if the person has is thinking like, I think I know the answer, but the person knows wrong then it can be lower than 50, right? And if the person knows more, like guesses kind of more correctly, it can be more, right? So if a person knows, let's say, 50% of the questions, what would be the score? So if the person knows correct answer for 50% of the questions, then what would be the score for that person? 75, right? And then this is because 50 questions will be correct because the person knows and for the 25 the person will guess right um, so then if a person knows 25 percent of the questions correctly what would be the score yeah. 67 right so you kind of see that it's really hard to get less than zero, right? So if we have a scale, um, we have zero points here. If a person doesn't answer anything, we have 50, 50 here and 100 here. And the reality is the exam is kind of in this space, right? I mean, this space doesn't matter. Like, people who, are, who know wrong are here. But people who know nothing are here and people who know a little bit are kind of starting here, right? Um, so what happens is we kind of map that from 0 to 100, and we kind of grade people, right? So a person who knows 50% to pass the exam needs to get 75 points, right? Make sense? OK, so now we do something else. What we do is we grade for correct answer 1, for the wrong answer, minus 1, and for no answer, 0. OK, so now with this marking schema, if a person knows nothing, what should be the score? Zero. If the person knows nothing but guesses everything. So nothing means I didn't answer anything, I got 0. If I'm guessing, what should I get? And I also know nothing. Zero. Exactly, I should get zero as well, right? And then if I know 50% of the questions, how much should I get? So I if I know 50% and I'm not guessing, I, I just answer them the stuff that I know, 50. And then with 25, 25, right? So now if I drew this, this scale, I can see that it actually goes from zero to 100, right? Is it possible to get that someone gets minus? Well, it is possible if, if someone knows nothing and guesses wrong, right? Not randomly, but has kind of um, confidence to guess wrong, right? So it is possible to go here, but it's kind of the scale now goes from 0 to 100, and then to pass the exam, you need to get 50 points, right? 
So to pass the exam with the second marking schema, you need 50. To pass the exam with the original marking schema, you need 75, right? Do you see the difference? So to pass the exam with the original marking schema, you need 75 points. To pass the exam with the second marking schema, with the minus points, you only need 50. Which one is better? I'm trying to sell it. <laughs> yeah? I, th I think people do a lot of false, uh, uh, false positives, where they believe they are having the correct answer and guess as well. Yes. Really get punished by this method. Exactly. So don't guess, right? Well, so I because I don't believe I'm guessing. I think I'm correct. <laughs> That's the deal. Yeah, so with the first method, there is no distinction between someone not knowing and someone guessing. With the second method, it's up to you to decide that. So you have the ability to decide whether you don't know something and you decide to guess, or sometimes subconsciously you might think you know, but you don't. In which case, um, we also want to know that, right? So um, this is kind of a, a form of an exam where we ask you, answer a question and tell us how confident you are when you answer that question. So we had exams in the past that had that. For each question you had a confidence, like I'm very confident, I'm you know, neutral and I'm not confident at all, I'm just guessing, right? We had three or, or four options for each question. And then we took that into account. So if you were very confident and you got it right, you got more points. But if you were kind of, I don't know, and you were guessing, you were kind of on a, kind of a zero level. But if you were very confident and you, you got it wrong, that means you should be punished because you're confident about something you shouldn't be confident about, right? It's something that, like, I'm, I'm have very strong opinion about something which is wrong, right? We don't want people to do that. Um, so this kind of exam is, uh, following that, that strategy, but uh, we cannot really in Inspira ask you about your confidence, so we sort of implicitly ask you about the confidence by you making this choice. So if you're unsure about a question, the best strategy is not to answer it. If you're sure about the question, you should answer it, and if you're like, I, I, I think I know the answer, but I, I don't quite know the answer, then you have to decide, right? And there is a curve, um, so if I um, kind of wrap it up. This, this one in theory sounds good. In practice, it's a little bit hard, okay? So in theory, more or less, um, if this is your um, confidence, so how confident you are uh, in the answer, right? So if, you, if you're very confident, um, and this is like, um, let's say it's a probability of how, how much you should be guessing. So the curve kind of looks like, like this. So if you're very confident, you should answer the question. If you're uh, about 66% confident, then it's like a breakout break point where it doesn't pay off anymore, right? So this one, even if you're confident about the wrong things, will in the long term pay off. Right? This strategy, if you kind of, in, in this regime, you should always answer. In this regime, um, to 33, it is kind of a mixture. And then here you should never answer, right? So you should kind of divide what you know and what you don't know. And kind of, if you think you kind of in here, you should answer the questions. Here, well, <laughs> it's kind of a, it's not a clear win. Here is a clear win. Even if you're wrong, sometimes you will kind of overall benefit from answering. Here, not sure. Here, you should definitely not answer, right? So there is kind of no guessing, like uh, in this exam. So in normal multi-choice exam, you should always guess if you don't know the answer. In this exam, don't guess, because you will kind of, the strategy of always guessing will actually not work well, right? Uh, so what you should do is you should think, Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure, then you should answer. I'm not sure, then probably you should not answer. So up to like below 66, you probably should not answer, right? Uh, how do you know something 66% of the time? Yeah, that's a tricky, tricky one, right? So math is simple. Math kind of tells us what the strategy should be. So for those of you who are gamers, it is kind of, uh, I, I think you understand the, what it means. 
like knowing yourself, like knowing how much you know something, that's tricky, right? And that is kind of the, um, the flavor of the exam. Like the exam actually asks you about what you know, but you also, it also asks you what you think you know and what you don't know, right? Uh, so it, we kind of assess that. Uh, it sounds complicated, but it boils down <laughs> for you to remembering not to guess things that you like you don't know, or if you are like 50-50. You say, if it's a true-false question and you really don't know, just don't guess, just leave it out, right? Um, so that's, um, that's the mechanics of the, of the kind of a multi-choice and multi-select questions. In the multi-select, mm -hmm. if you, um, so I can tell you that in multi-select, we don't have multi-select where everything is wrong and you cannot tick anything. So in multi-select, at least one tick has to happen, okay? We don't have tricky question like there is no tick, but we, we may have some which have all ticks, right? So you don't know. Um, and then if you, let's say it's all correct and you only tick two, that's good. It's better than if you didn't tick anything, right? Um, so like individual ticks don't kind of um, reflect the overall answer, like they are scored individually, right? So for each tick, think whether you should tick it or not. And it, it doesn't matter for the overall, I mean it matters, but they are not related in a sense that you, um, what I'm trying to say is that, for example, in normal exams, if the answer is the first three and the last one, and you only do two, then you don't get points because you didn't do the pattern. Here, the pattern doesn't matter. Like it matters individually on each line, right? Yeah, you had a question? Yeah. Um, why isn't, isn't it possible to find out how fast you are for each question on the stair? Isn't that just another choice? <laughs> yeah, so um, Simon uh, is another lecturer who tried to do that. And what it means is for each question, we have to have two questions. And then, then Inspera actually treats the, the confidence question as an exam question and scores it. And then you have to extract what the answer was from the score the students get. So it's a, a bit of a complicated formula, how you can extract that. Then you have to export it to a giant spreadsheet where you have to reconcile what the actual answer was with what the student did. Because in Inspera, you cannot treat something not as an exam question and get the raw data for it. You can only get the scores. Right, so if, if we have a confidence questions for each question, it's logistically kind of difficult to run exam this way. Right, we had exams like this in the past, but it's a lot of work. Uh, a it's a nightmare. Yeah, so unfortunately, we kind of like it. We and students tend to like the confidence questions more because then you kind of explicit, like you can just say I'm guessing, uh, and that's fine because then you kind of are 50-50. Right, you scored. So we usually, with the confidence, what we did, we had a uh, uh, scoring, which is uh, if you like, if you're confident, then you get minus two and two for the cor for the wrong answers and correct answers. So co high confidence. If you're neutral, then you get um, uh, zero. Uh, yeah, I think it's zero and one. And if you uh, may maybe it's. Uh, Minus one, one, and then it's like zero, one, right? So you're kind of not losing if you say I'm guessing. You're not losing anything, but you're kind of getting 50-50, right? If you get it right, right? Um, so it, it is kind of it boils down to the same curve and the same mechanics that I explained to you. It's just that it's a different form of asking that question of how confident you are, right? Here it's kind of implicit. Um, Right, so, um, yeah, any, any other questions? So it kind of boils down to you trying not to guess things that you don't know, just leave them out. Um, yeah? If you want to know what the students know, why not have only short answer questions and you can actually see the knowledge rather than just having them pick boxes and have a complicated uh, exam bingo? Yeah, that's right. So that is a very valid question. And for 70 students, it takes us three days to mark it, right? For this one, it takes us uh, 10 seconds because the computer does it, right? So it's a uh, uh, quality to resources 
question, right? So I, I, uh, I agree with this. And that's on the kind of negative side. On the positive side, um, when you're marking answer questions, you, you still do, you have a huge human element, right? So if, uh, if you, have you marked like 100 exams in, in the past yourself? Yeah, so you cannot be objective through the whole process. There is a human element, right? So with the computer marking, there is no human element. It's just, you know, uh, very objective. So that, that's the positive side. But uh, I don't know. Well, we have some short answers. We do we have, have some short answers. So they yeah. So, so they, they do, uh, exactly, because we not rely entirely on the computer. We do have some questions which we have to mark manually. And, and yeah. Also, I wish it would only take ten seconds to mark the automatic. Yeah, that's true. It, it's it's still it still takes us about yes. a day. Yeah, yeah. Are there going to be any coding or just questions? Yeah, there will be. Uh, the there might be some coding questions. So you need to type some code. That will be in Go. That will be in Go. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yep. Is it possible that you can get more help with um, correcting exams or with how? Yeah, I mean, it, it is possible. It is possible, but it's not really possible with, with Inspera. So, like, we are investigating it, how it, c it can be done, but, like, with Inspera, it cannot really be done. So, the way Simon ran it in New Zealand this year was he basically ran an exam through his own spreadsheet, which students were filling up the answers distributed by Git. And that was an electronic exam, but it was completely outside of Inspera. And uh, I'm not sure we are allowed to do that. Uh, yeah. Right. So um, yeah, that that pretty much covers it, right? Yes. Yeah. Next one. So yeah. So confidence in the answer about guessing and about scoring. It should be clear. Um, so now, what we All talked right. about. Finally, so every time it's pulling that exam thing off. Okay, um, <laughs> so in terms of content, what we actually talked about, there wasn't too much. It was mostly programming this course, right? Who agrees? Good. So we can kind of, you know, uh, skip, wave the exam, we all give you an A on that one. No, we can't. Bad luck. Um, because we still have the external assessment, otherwise, we're not allowed to call this a, a, a university bachelor anymore. So um, there were certain aspects we talked about. Um, foundations and Linux a bit, if you still recall, it's like during the Ice Age. So, and then Go programming. Um, yes, you talked about a lot about this. REST, cloud economics, hosting, SLAs. That's something we snuck in last minute because we feared, oh damn, what should we ask? We don't have anything to ask them, right? So, because they're so, uh, um, um, well, relatively little that we covered this year. For example, we didn't really go deep into networking, which is a bit of a pity. Um, because it's a good subject and it kind of fits the cloud pattern quite well. Um, but let's um, iterate through some of the aspects that are probably you know more more relevant because in all cases there's at least one or two lectures attached and sometimes it's good to get a bit of a zoning you know uh, zoning in on certain aspects that are more or less important for uh, for for the exam because we wouldn't I'm not the kind of guy that would expect you to learn slide sets in a, the entirety or some things but rather principles. Um, so. <coughs> In, in Linux, we briefly talked about the uh, idea of POSIX, but um, I can tell you already, this will not be an exam. Um, but the second one will be, um, uh, or maybe, the permission system. Uh, it's important that you understand how permissions work in Linux, right? So we, we had a bit of a uh, classroom exercise on that one. How this file system is set up, you know, it's different from um, Windows, I think it is, right? Yeah, it's okay, cool. Um, and we talk a bit about packet management as well, right? So how do you install software in Linux? You should be comfortable with this one. In any case, when we talk about Linux, we kind of make reference to the Linux we used in this course for teaching that's always Ubuntu or any Debian-based distribution. So we not ask you to, f you know, some ex obscure commands for some um, um, systems you have never seen before. Um, and foreground, background operation, we re didn't really talk about this. Either so we kind of um, take this out as well. I just put listed here as those are 
principles that I think you should in principle kind of know about, but the three ones at the center are the ones that are possibly relevant for the exam. Um, permissions, um, sorry for the chopped off slides, it's I think an artifact of running on a Mac, I suspect, anyway. But this is basically just uh, an extract from one of the slide sets, you remember that one. It basically explains the permission system, so just bear that in mind. Of course, I'm not asking you to redraw that slide or whatever else, it's just to, uh, to, to reconstruct your understanding, right? How the bit representation works in the permission system and how it translates to the decimal representation that you use when you change permissions, right? So that kind of idea there. Um, yeah, this was um, the, the, the standard uh, layout of the file system hierarchy in Linux. Um, you know, as long as you understand the principles, which commands to use to do what, what are important commands related to the file system hierarchy for navigating that we had? Please. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Touch, right? So that kind of stuff. What else? MV? CP, yeah. Yeah, I think that covers it actually. Right, so that, that stuff, right? So just uh, navigating, modifying the uh, file system because that's something you need to know, you need to be able to do. Right, cool. Networking, yeah. based the, that's technically. We'll cover the first three points. What's the first three points? There's not much to cover there. So uh, we didn't talk about ports, we didn't talk about OC layers, and we didn't talk about socket programming. Oh, did we? Hang on, yes, you did. we did. You did, in yeah. week two, you talked yeah. about socket programming. That's right. So um, so networking, we did it far less than we would have wanted to. Um, that's kind of a bit of a tricky one. Usually, we'll ask you some nasty questions about the OC layers. That's not going to happen, said, because that's the, my favorite one. Anyway, um, and we didn't talk about classing, classful addressing schemes and IP addresses. To some extent, you know how they look like, but not much more. And yeah. Marius insisted on giving uh, having an appendix yeah, of okay. an idea. All right. So um, lecture time. Uh, very short lecture time. So um, who knows what are classless and classful um, IP addressing schemas? All right. So you should read about it. <laughs> okay. Um, IP address consists of four, uh, four bytes, and those four bytes are, you know, eight bits, right? So we have um, networks which consist of a certain number of computers, and then depending on how many computers you want in the network, you can kind of di dictate the bits for the addressing the computers and the bits addressing the network, right? So if I have a notation which is a slash notation and I say slash eight, it means I'm dedicating eight bits for the computers and then um, the rest is the, uh, the network. Uh, uh, actually eight bits for the network and then the rest are the, the kind of a computer addresses, right? So then with eight, I have kind of a class A with 16, I have class B, and then with uh, 24, I have class C. So depending how far, how I do the bit mask, then I have the different class, right? So we do have one question about this, and the question is, I will tell you what the question is. So we kind of are giving up that question, and you all should answer it correctly. We're asking, um, uh, 192.168.0.1, one, what is this? It's an IP address, but what is special about this IP address? Yeah? Uh, depends on the network mask. But is it a public IP address or is it a private IP address? It's a private IP address, right? So it is an IP address which is used for LAN. It's not used for you connecting to it, right? In a, in a normal internet. And then if I say slash 16, that is what? That will be a class B. Uh, network which has uh, 2 to the power of 16 minus 2 computers in the network, right? So this one specifically is class B mask for a network addressing, right? And it's classful. So classful uh, 16, 8, 16, and 24, classless are somewhere in between, right? And that's that's all you need to know for the exam. And the answer to this is that yes, this slash 16 is classful and it's a class B, right? 
So you, don't, you may not understand this, and you can answer the question correctly. You don't need to guess, because the answer is yes, true, that, that is class full B. Uh, but if you want to understand, you can read a little bit on it at home and, and like learn, but it will not be in the exam. In the exam, we only have this one question, right? Yeah? You don't have the dot one there at the end. Uh, you don't need the dot one, yeah. You no, can because then it wouldn't be an Afric address. Uh, it no, it doesn't matter. It is, it is still at zero. Though. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So you, you would have zero here normally. Yes. Yeah. Um, so using the opportunity that I'm here, I, I just want to mention two more things about the exam. So because it's an electronic exam, the computer will not correct for nuance, right? So you have to pay attention to two things. So one, one th uh, thing is precision. Uh, so you have to be quite precise of what the question is, because for true and false question is like fundamental, right? Uh, so for example, if you have not in the question, the answer completely flips, right? So if the question is, is this correct, true, false, or is this not correct, true, false, you, you need to pay attention, right? Um, so the not pay attention to negative questions, right? Uh, we try not to be very tricky, but there are some questions we use not, and then you need to factor it that in, right? Um, the second thing is, we try to filter all the typos, and definitely in the exam, there is no null versus nil typo, right? If we, s w if we said null or if we said nil, that means there is no typo, we've already double checked that. So don't say, oh yeah, I thought it was a typo, so I answered this, right? Um, don't do that, like uh, with those little things we, we double check. There might be other typos, but with null and nil there is no typo. Um, Building on this, perhaps just as an insect, the exam uh, has a uh, open entry field where you at any time, though you need to go back, unfortunately that's it's fairer, where you can make comments with respect to questions, right? So sometimes people have different interpretation of a given question. If you take a certain take on it, you're kind of not sure, you can write there, hey, for class, for question 23, I interpret the question as follows, right? Because we had this in the past that people see it differently and it kind exactly. of could make sense. So we accommodate all that. So anytime you have uh, uh, concerns, questions, or interpretation angles, put them in the comments, make reference to the question, of course, uh, that, you're, that you're answering, and then answer it following your intuition. Yeah. Exactly. So we, we kind of bend the exam a bit to you individually, so we actually review all of them and look at the comments that you all write. So don't, don't, don't worry if you feel, oh, I don't know what is meant here. Rather say, tell us what you think it's meant there, and it's like totally different, of course, and then answer the question accordingly. Does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. So precision, pay attention to not, typos, and um, last year we also had this case where people misread and and or, right? So in the, in the exam, we kind of follow the mathematical uh, meanings of and and or. So if there is a sentence and the sentence says something and something, it means this and this mathematically, right? So if one of them is false, the sentence is false. Do you get me? Because in normal speech, we don't treat it mathematically, right? So if you say, uh, on weekend I'm gonna go skiing and gonna go to, to movies, right? And then if you only went to the movies, you kind of still consider it a true sentence, right? We, we just didn't do one of those things. Um, but mathematically, you kind of failed, right? Because you didn't do both, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so th th there might be some questions where it says something and something, or something or something, and then or is like neither of them or both, and means both, right? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> okay. So that was the shortest networking lecture I ever had. <laughs> not sure if I understand it, but um, let's do it. Uh, anyway. Um, so this is something you will not see in the exam, so sad. That's the ISO OC layout. I should talk briefly about this. And this is a nightmare, the layout here. Um, okay, right, networking done. Um, I'll you know, kind of try to translate the uh, lower part here. Um, so one of the aspects we talked about is, for example, of course, cloud computing. You know, some of the, um, it's kind of an umbrella term for um, 
the idea that we have internet deployed services, right? Development uh, um, and, and services. So the uh, assumption is there that you use some sort of remote functionality. It's not you know hosted in your in your in your in your um, cellar basically. Even though it's a kind of a data center, that's not cloud. Cloud re means that it's kind of remotely hosted and accessible because that's the cloud uh, association more generally. So it should not be confused with a data center. Um, there is ubiquity, at least to some extent, associated with this, meaning you can access it from anywhere, like you guys can say access AWS or uh, Heroku from anywhere. And the idea is that, uh, well, what's, what's the major effect of it is effectively that um, the um, computing power is commodified, right? So it's no longer uh, kind of, um, you don't no longer need to own the resource, basically, such as a computer or server or whatever, and manage yourself. You can treat everything as a service, basically. Right? If I need a bit of computing here, I can just uh, uh, buy this, basically, right? The time for, for doing this computing, as opposed to having this complex setup. That's the meaning of commodified here. It's uh, available on demand, right? So, um, and in incremental um, steps. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's getting worse, isn't it? Yeah. All right. I probably need to let go into the... Yeah, let, me, let me do this. Yeah. Help. So... Uh, is, that, is that a PDF you are? Yeah, let's do the... I think it was lower and lower and lower. So at some stage, we hit the full page again. Yeah. So the question is when? That's also a nice exam exercise. See what's missing on that slide and figure out <laughs> what I wanted to say. I like this. Should probably do it for lectures more generally. Um, yeah, that's your. Yeah. All right, that's what we'll do. That, that will do. That will do. do. So at least we find something. So let's go to the networking again. Pass the networking. It shows all the slides. There's some I don't want to show anyway. Oh, you've covered commodification. So, that's good. so there we are again, right? So the principles that you know about yeah. in this context um, are the idea that everything is available as a service, right? We talked about different as a service concepts. Which ones were those? Yeah. Yeah. What else? The first one, the, the last one? Service as a service. Software as a service, right? You could. There was one other one that we talked about. Marge, in fact, talked about it in one of the last lectures. What was that one? Like some things between IS and PAS? Uh, IS and PAS? Yeah, yeah, to some extent. Yeah, what, what, what was, was the keyword? What is the keyword? It's also as a service. That's, that's the giveaway. Yes. Lambda, remember? What was that about? AWS Lambda, you guys recall it? Oh, well, it's, it's like cloud software you can deploy on cloud infrastructure. Yeah, that's right. But what was the idea there? What, was it just IAS basically, or was it something else? Function. So, what's the term then? Correct, functions as a service, right? So it's also a thing. So, so the idea is they have very coarse-grained infrastructure as a service, right? Where you build the entire system, your entire virtual data center, or whatever else, right? Platform as a service where someone else deals with this kind of data center thing, but you just plug in software you write. Then you have software as a service on top where you just use someone else's software, basically, which runs in the cloud. Office 365 is a classic. You don't program against this. You just use it. You may perhaps script against it. And there's function as a service, a small, small, small subset of functionality that you want to expose for programming purposes, right? So it's, it sits uh, a bit higher than probably platform as a service. So really, but just before software as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can isolate, you know, business logic and the like. So that's one of those concepts. Of course, there's more, right? If, if you put function, uh, uh, sorry, as a service into Google, well, you'll be thrown at with new ideas and so on. Um, for example, lecture as a service would be good. Eh? <laughs> That'd be nice. On demand, I need a lecture now. Um, but this is fundamentally the ones we discussed, right? So um, to, to some extent. Um, and the key thing is someone else does it for you and you don't quite know where it's run necessarily, especially in a cloud context. And it, it just means, well, sometimes you kind of know where it's run because in AWS you can select a certain data center where it should be run, but still you have no clue how it actually looks like, how the internal network structure really is, and you certainly don't touch the actual hardware, right? That's a good, that's a good um, 
um, acid test for that one. Uh, it's a pay-as-you-go model, so you have a high level of flexibility um, and you only pay as much as you use, right? So that's that's the key difference there. You don't have upfront investments, so those are kind of the, the economic aspects you want to bear in mind in this. Um, and you have an um, ability to scale up. So it's not just, oh, I pay as much as go, but also the ability to scale up and down the demand based on, you know, your load on a system. Uh, our classic example was kind of, you know, peak seasons for example at christmas time you're running web shop guess what you need to accommodate this your um your, your servers uh, you know running your bedroom which usually works for most of part of a year will probably not be able to deal with the load you may experience there so that's that's one of the aspects uh, that we talked about there those are the different computing service models you recall them right so they're very to the extent to which aspects are virtualized right so in the uh, base model iis the virtualization happens on the network level, so you're, you're virtualizing a complete network. And I know you guys understand this because you suffered through this when setting up OpenStack, because you need to set up a network, right? So whether I knew or what you did or not doesn't really matter, but you needed to set up the network. Uh, processing is virtual, you have no clue which service is running on. In fact, you, if you want to figure it out, you need to go to Lars Eric. He can tell you, hey, your VM is running on this server. He can actually tell you, but you have no way of finding it out, really. Um, unless you have yeah, this permission set. Uh, and of course storage, the same, right? You don't quite know where your data lies. That's the main idea here, that this is virtualized, and then it increasingly goes up. In past, we don't know what the operating system is, or don't need to know, rather. That's the main point there. And for um, software as a service, we even don't have a, you know, even the application itself is managed uh, for us. So that's the main, main uh, idea that you want to get away with. Um, yeah, so that's basically IAS characteristic. I don't think I need to go through this one. This is really more like uh, 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 repetition to, to some extent. And of course, the slide set will be available to you, so you can go through it on your own uh, to see um, that it's more on the IAS side. Relevant is there that we're dealing with VMs, container services. We're dealing with, you know, kind of data center management problems as opposed to just your software, right? So that's the kind of idea. Generally offered a wide range of different services. Uh, you need to deal with all that networking stuff. And of course, very important, monitoring services. We didn't talk about software configuration management, um, but that's um, done in other courses. Um, opportunities and challenges for um, cloud services. Do you guys recall those? You? should take the exam, huh? Yeah. Yeah, try it. See if we make it. Um, well. The opportunities, of course, you can use stuff without knowing much about it, right? So if you know using Office 365 and so on, you don't need to know the, the background, how it's actually done, of course, that's an opportunity. But also you don't need to know about much about infrastructure, for example, if you want to run a server, uh, um, which and you wouldn't be able to you know, set one up yourself. In fact, you, you have there's a lot of assistance in doing this. And depending on which, as a service level you choose, you would have the uh, flexibility of choosing it, uh, using it. So. Um, the economics of scale or economy of scale principle is an, is an interesting one. Um, we talked about it in one section and the idea is basically there by concentrating computational power in very few um, vendors that run it, providers, AWS, Azure, Cloud, uh, Google, and so on, they can um, do the heavy investment in uh, cloud computing resources and have relatively low marginal costs for adding yet another node or whatever else. So it's really, really cheap for them. Whereas if you in your bedroom, you have two nodes running, you add a third one, it's relatively expensive for you doing this, right? And by having this low marginal cost, they're able to give you um, computing services at a fraction of the price you would be uh, paying if you were to be running it yourself. That's the main point. If there wasn't this concentration of cloud computing resources in data centers with those bigger players, you wouldn't have those economies of scale, right? The more you run, the cheaper it is to add yet another node. That's the idea there, right? Um, so there's a bit of a natural concentration in cloud computing that is necessary to make it useful because if everyone runs a moderate number of nodes then it's still reasonably expensive on average to expand this network or, um, and that's no surprise that we have those three big players um, uh, controlling, the, not controlling, but uh, dominating rather uh, the market. And of course there's other advantages, they get software cheaper than you do, so if you want to run Windows, your license on Windows may actually be quite a bit cheaper if you run AWS than it would be in-house. Um, so the cost is kind of on demand. The nice part is there, 
Um, a second aspect, you don't need to fork out money in advance. You just see how it goes. If there's no load, well, surprise, surprise, then you don't pay. Remember, for example, the cloud functions that uh, Mahesh talked about in uh, AWS Lambda, there was a certain pricing per request or per, you know, um, a certain unit uh, number of requests that was um, involved. Cool. Um, so, and of course, for the vendors itself, it means they have an ongoing revenue stream just providing those services. So they don't need to worry about your end product, about your web shop, whatever else. They just provide the services. So they concentrate their efforts and activities onto running this data center, meaning they uh, organize the, the admin, staff ops, and whatever, monitoring crew, and so on, uh, and support. And that's something you don't need to deal with. You just bought this by actually buying the services on demand. That's the idea. Um, so, and the accessibility of anywhere, again, that's the, that's the main, main, main point. I just want to highlight the economies of scale in particular. Um, we, uh, in conjunction with this, we talked about the opportunities for you um, as developers, what is probably worthwhile to look into, uh, realizing that SaaS and IIS have a kind of, you know, uh, significantly more uh, uh, stronger relevance in the future, at least by this projection, than, for example, PaaS, which is good for prototyping, but then quickly hits its limit. Some of you guys played um, for the advanced assignments with um, Heroku and probably found out that scalability is to some extent um, limited and certainly defined by the vendor itself. Um, so, yeah, so what are the challenges of cloud computing? Um, you kind of depend on others, which is kind of sometimes not a good idea, right? If you're, their internet is offline, well, you know, you're, you're, which is rare, of course, then your uh, cloud system probably won't really work. Um, there's a f certain aspects that um, are challenges also a buy-in, meaning if you're scripted against AWS, OpenStack, or uh, Google or whatever else, then it's reasonably hard to transfer your resources, right? To just uh, um, replicate this data system, especially if you do infrastructure as a service, to move or to migrate uh, your resources to another vendor. So it's reasonably expensive. Um, that's why um, or you need to rewrite quite a lot of code. So you have kind of an element of a, of a lock-in as well. It's not just moving the VM from one vendor to another. There are efforts in uniform, unifying this transition, but still there's an incentive uh, on the part of those individuals, uh, players, not to, of course, uh, accommodate this too, too, too broadly. Um, so there's the monopolization in the market, which is a bit of a downside, but also a necessity. So there's the trade of how much monopolization should we tolerate, basically. If it's too little, well, then we have high prices relatively. Um, uh, for the marginal cost high, if we allow too much, then we also get high prices because they control the market in entirety. Um, so there's a bit of a, yeah, so... Um, we have a bit of a, a, bit, a bit of a, um, a challenge there again that we have a uh, opportunity again to really have high performance um, computing that can be embedded as cloud computing nowadays, which was kind of um, is kind of a cyclic return to the mainframe area in that expect that you at that time had this kind of giant uh, um, you know the mainframe concept the idea that you have a stupid dumb terminal or um, a thin client basically with which you would connect to this uh, mainframe and do your computation there um, and you would have 30 of those but those clients themselves couldn't do much then we had the pc revolution where everything was done individually as it's done now and now with the cloud we're kind of moving it back again to connecting to cloud services but not doing much on our own endpoints so it's a bit of a cyclic ele uh, uh, element there where we give up a bit of autonomy again so it's probably something to to recognize as well Security is a big issue, of course. You know, who owns the data? Uh, which country is it running in? Which policy applies to it? GDPR is a keyword. Um, what happens if a server goes down? Who is liable for all this? And so on. Um, and, you know, how do you claim uh, locked accounts, right? So how do you credibly um, uh, reassure that you can actually uh, get into your uh, account again? Um, so it's... Um, um, though there's no clear-cut either law or... Um, uh, general rule for this for those purposes. So just something to bear in mind. There are security issues related to cloud that Co-hosting as well. Uh, of course, uh, and none the least is the idea of co-hosting which is challenging. Co-hosting is the idea that You don't know with whom you're pairing, right? So you could sit on the literally on the same physical server as your uh, Hardest competitor in the market and you wouldn't know because in AWS you wouldn't see it, right? 
So basically, you, the idea that there could be potential tr security transgressions from uh, other uh, clients of your <coughs> cloud vendor. This is of course not the rule, but the point is about security. It is the possibility because you're not isolated uh, customer or user of the system in public cloud systems. Um, scalability. So uh, Marsh promised me he talked about scalability. Yeah, I and remember the horizontal and vertical when we were talking about load balancing earlier. Yes, does it ring a bell? Some bells, yeah. I nearly hear some bells here. Cool, yeah, that's cool. Okay, we're getting there. So um, basically the idea that um, one of the opportunities, of course, is the flexibility of uh, uh, being able to scale up, right? If you have more demand, web shop season, Christmas coming up, um, then you need to uh, scale up. And how you do it, there's different strategies for this, right? So um, horizontal scalability, again, is just yet another instance or another VM or, you know, that can be added or another node in, 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 in your, in your in your cluster that can be added. And the vertical scalability would mean, oh, leave the nodes as they are. No, don't leave them as they are. Leave the number of nodes, but scale them up individually, right? Give them more RAM, give them more CPU and so on. That's called vertical scalability. So those two concepts are interesting. Um, one of the challenges that's also important for scalability um, is that we should operate stateless um, where possible. That means the server should not need to hold state about the client um, in particular about the client's connection status because um, the challenge is we didn't really go into depth in terms of well you talk about load balancing that's uh, relevant um, the challenge there is simply that if you um, have a connection that needs to be maintained across the entire infrastructure having more complex infrastructure requires uh, for example load balancers to be able to retain sessions um, aspects like this so it becomes more complicated in a virtualized system to uh, distribute the state, right? So how do you know if the same server actually responds to your client request um, uh, than the next request, right? So you have multiple requests in a session and you're trying to connect to a server and the load balancer may randomly distribute those requests. Uh, but it needs now it needs to be able to trace back which was the original server you were interacting with. So the more statefulness you have, right? Um, the more expensive it becomes um, for um, to, to run cloud systems and the more it limits load balancing. So statelessness is desirable where possible. REST is a good example for this because each request is individually, right? So no previous requests generally depends on a su uh, subsequent request, right? If you do a post request and a get request afterwards or the other way around, it doesn't really matter. They're treated individually. They're not, you know, part of one single session. That's kind of one of the examples of statelessness that uh, I used in the cloud context. We could have gone deep on this one, but yeah, um, we couldn't. So SLAs, briefly. Um, you uh, have found a linked lecture on SLAs. More important, the slide set. The lecture is rather motivational just to highlight the key principles. If you browse through the slide set there, you kind of get the gist. And the idea is there that we want to uh, make you aware of. Um, you may be customers of cloud service in the future, or you may provide cloud services, but it's probably more a subset of you. Um, and that's important to think about SLAs, right? So we don't do the kind of, we're not legal scholars, I think. And, um, but we need to deal with law to some extent. And some of it is actually having uh, well-specified uh, service level agreements. And those are the agreements that you uh, agree on with either your customer or um, that you um, agree on with your cloud provider, for example, right? So what's, what's in an SLA typically? What would you find there? Come on, there's one thing that you would at least expect. Even if you have never heard about SLAs before, service level agreements, what's the thing that's usually found there? Yeah. Ah, between who? Between, between, ah, you were talking about it. So you have a... No, uh, no, no, so I, I was ah, thinking... Right, that was the answer already. Between whom? Yeah, cool, what else? Yeah. Expected uptime? Ha, uptime, right, so that's a classic one, right? The famous 99% or something like this. 99.9, .9, right? So it's a bit of an exercise as well in the slide set in, in the, um, that's linked. You can have a look at this. We'll not go really deep in this. It's really more to understand what SLAs are about. But what's more important is what, what you would expect to find in SLA. So briefly go through this one now. Um, so generally, there should be quite specific set out terminology. Who's the client? Who's the provider? The contracts, basically. Everything should be measurable as far as possible. Put metrics to it. Uptime is a classic one, right? So how do you... Uh, do it so like uh, service times but also penalty what happens if you don't commit to it well if you want to guarantee 99 percent uptime but you don't have any penalty if you don't commit uh, you know satisfy the customer then you are pretty powerless as a client right <coughs> 
so it's important. Uh, assignable, who does what, right? So really, if they are, oh, something should be done, it should also be clear who should do it, right? Same with issues, similar as there. You should assign someone who's responsible for this. Things should be realistic. You don't want to have, you know, uh, blue sky uh, information values and so on, or want to trick your respective uh, uh, counterpart. You do s you use something that's actually realistic. If you think about latency, well, sometimes you can't get the latency you want if you're in a remote region, right? So that's one of those points. Um, if there are specific time requirements, response time is probably sometimes more important than availability. In fact, how quickly do you get any response from the service support team or whatever else if an incident happens, right? So are they open 24 seven or only two days a week, right? So that's, that's kind of a bit of an issue, uh, could be, right? Um, and again, uh, standards for reviews. So how often is this SLA reviewed? Every two years, every 12 months, who knows? And what are the penalties associated with? Both in terms of uh, time or you know, any, any other way. Um, so those are some of the aspects um, that are in SLAs. I, it's, it's, it, there's nothing much about computing there. It's more really about, about thinking about what should be in a, thor in, a, in, in a service level agreement that you enclose. What are, should be the aspects that should be considered? And those are kind of the more, um, the baseline at least of all the aspects. So if you were to write up one yourself, at least here's, you know, there are templates, but here you give an intuition uh, uh, as to what you would look for. And it's mostly related to be specific, terminology, measurability, who does what, ensure that the stuff is realistic and that you have certain time uh, specification as well. Any quick questions regarding this? Shouldn't be hard. That's the easy bit, I think, of the exam. Virtualization? You want to talk about this? Um, type 1, type 2, Docker. Right, so type, two, uh, type 1 runs on hardware directly. Type 2 runs on operating system on hardware. So, and then, uh, well, and then it's Docker. Docker is technically not type 2 virtualization itself, but it sits on top of it, right? It's a container level, um, a containerization. So some people don't even call it virtualization. So it's kind of sits at, it's a bit at odds. But certainly sitting on a higher level than all those uh, three ones because it basically feeds off the host operating system. It definitely requires an operating system, but it doesn't require this idea of a hypervisor that allows you to run multiple VMs, right? It still runs on the same operating system. So um, this is different from type 1 and type 2 virtualization. That's the important thing. Some people call it application level virtualization or service level virtualization. But there's a bit of a war around this as well. So, but more importantly to recognize the differences between those ones. And this figure highlights it quite nicely uh, as you see here, right? So here you really have the hardware, the host operating system, then the Docker daemon, the stuff you installed by, you know, the script of 10 lines. Um, so you get the latest version, that's the Docker daemon. And, uh, and then afterwards you're just running your Docker containers individually, right? So that's the key thing. Just that's the message I want to get across here. I think we talked about this. Um, Docker, what are the principles? What are images, containers, volumes? How to create images? There's both examples of it, but you also hopefully did it yourself. Uh, how would you dockerize application services? Well, not so much how you would do it, but rather why you would do it. That's probably more the important aspect for the exam. If you, the how would be more a uh, typical um, assignment problem. We talk about multi-stage builds, why we need them. And you need to figure out why we actually need them again, because we talked about it, right? Remind me. Don't yeah, good, thank you. <sighs> uh, memories. Um, so that's one of the aspects. But here more, some of the principles to, to, for, 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 for Docker that are relevant for us, uh, of course. It's a relatively simple use. Some may agree, some may not. But if you compare to taking someone else, we should actually do that take someone else's software off GitHub and trying to run that stuff compared to setting up, you know, running uh, it in Docker in, in one line with one simple command, you'll find that it's relatively simple, right? It standardizes the execution patterns. Uh, it is also uh, serves as documentation for the, um, for the deployment, right? So it documents how things should be deployed, which otherwise would be found in a readme file, which would be semi-helpful often. But in any case, uh, this needs to guarantee that it works. Um, it's centered around speed, so containerization uh, uh, deals with the idea, and that's, again, multi-stage builds to minimize the size of containers, so they run uh, as fast as possible, minimize the resource use, and uh, maximize, ideally, performance. Um, there is an ecosystem around this. We briefly looked at Docker Hub, or you saw Docker Hub briefly. 
Anyway, just type it into Google. You'll see what Docker is. It's GitHub for Docker containers, basically. So quite straightforward. Many of you know it. So it's kind of a nice way around it as well that you can actually host a, a ready-made Docker system. Um, Docker container. So it allows you to be modular. So that was one of the aspects. Recall that we discussed the decomposition uh, of uh, into minimal service functionality. So if you have a service that on the one hand has an API, right, pressed. on the other hand has a database sitting behind it, well, there probably should be two Docker uh, containers, right, two containers. Uh, so you can uh, modify them individually, number one, but also scale them individually, number two, right? So you could have multiple endpoints with one database uh, uh, or conversely the opposite, having a um, single API with multiple databases behind it. So you want to isolate and modularize functionality using Docker containers. So it kind of factors in a bit uh, into your uh, construction of your system, right? The layout uh, of your software that you develop. And Docker has this kind of layered approach. We talk about, about this, that it incrementally builds um, the containers by based on the individual commands. It's a nice uh, 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 feature um, to, to some extent um, because it allows them, it minimizes basically the um, container size. But the idea is that it's um, in the build process that it has individual build stages there. It's not really relevant, uh, super relevant for our perspective, but it's nice from a, a management perspective, I guess. For us, the um, the modularity and the simply uh, simplified use is important. Okay, um, cool. We didn't talk about much configuration drift, and we will not ask this in the exam as well. Just tell you what it is. Uh, it's basically if you have uh, uh, you're running, you know, your 20 computers, right? So and there's one issue. You're fixing it by figuring out the configuration, and then you move on with your life. And then there's another computer that has the same kind of problem. And at some stage, you figure out you have 20 machines that all have slightly different configurations, right? But they're no longer compatible to each other, right? That would be configuration drift, which is a big problem. Again, it's more an infrastructure problem. Uh, but the idea there is that you should ideally script or automate the deployment of configuration. Um, um, so software configuration management is the keyword here to prevent configuration drift. Not be not an issue in exam, but you, for good for you to know what this is, right? It's this ad hoc change of of um, uh, configurations. So the other one is we talked about different ways of um, writing um, Docker images. Um, and one of them was the uh, way that you use Docker files, the one you did hopefully use. And that's the other one, which is interactive, where you actually start an empty image and you actually individually, you, you, you install stuff in the uh, actual container, right? And commit this incrementally. And that's often conferred, referred to as the golden image. Why was that the case? You cannot, right? Is that what you say? Right, yeah, exactly. So exactly, that's precisely it. There's no way, it's like this, this magic image, everything links to that image because, oh, that's the image we use in our company, but no one has a clue how this thing came about, how it was built, because everything was done interactively and just committed, right? As opposed to having a Docker file where everything is explicit. So avoid those, they're good for hacking around, prototyping until you know, but even then they're not optimal. I don't know, they probably should get rid of this feature. Uh, Huh? Yeah. It's, it's just bad, I guess. Um, but it's uh, this hacky kind of approach. In any case, they should be avoided. So you don't want to have this magic, this golden image. That's why it's, I refer to it. Cool. Um, and then, you know, containerization takes over the world. Again, that's not a big, uh, big challenge here. Um, we, I don't think we touched any, th uh, any, any uh, of this one in great detail. Myers talked about the, uh, Amazon, the ECS container registry, which is kind of the um, Amazon equivalent for uh, kind of uh, Docker Hub basically, and then the Elastic Container Service, which basically allows you to deploy Docker on Amazon Web Services. But you know that you can deploy it on AWS, and that's roughly enough as what you need. We'll not ask nasty AWS questions, right? Do we know? No. We'll ask about what is AWS, but we'll not ask about all the 25 services. Well, actually, more like 65. Okay. Um, so um, some words on Go. That was roughly the rundown for some of the computing aspects you want to review again. Um, of course, in greater depth there, but it's just to give you some pointers. Maj has a few words on Go. Yeah, perhaps. so um, there are some questions related to Go, to the language itself. There are some uh, simple programming tasks, potentially. Um, and there, is, um, uh, there are some questions about the tooling. So the questions about Go are kind of a more about the features of the language and the ecosystem and the tooling of the of the framework, right? 
so recall all the professionalism and all the things that we were kind of requiring for doing um, for your assignments. Um, so there is, um, because most of the Go assessment has happened through the assignments, so we don't really test thoroughly the programming aspects, we kind of uh, test more of the meta aspects of the of the ecosystem. That's pretty much it. Cool. Yeah. Next, next slide, is Um. Like how you use the language, how do you use ecosystem, how do you use modules, how do you use dependencies, how you do testing, how you do no, linting and, and rather, so on. Rather more why. And right? why, yeah. Why yeah. Yeah, 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 that's you know, right. That kind of level. Not how, the how is more like the skills, and the why yeah. is more like the knowledge. As yeah. You, you yeah, understand right. why you're doing what we told you to do, right? So you need to be able to bring this into professional practice and say, hey, we should do actually testing because. Right? Mm. Irrespectively of how it actually works. Because that's different for different languages, but the principles of needing to do testing, for example, are always the same, right? That's the kind of angle we look at right now. So very much in this high level. Yeah. So questions. Yes. Back to add the door. Uh, when you say or do you mean exclusive or or just normal or N N normal or okay. Yeah. Because in English you'd say you can have pudding or you can have cake, you can't really have both. You can have either. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> inclusive or exclusive or? Yeah, so it's a normal, um, normal or not exclusive or. And with end, we mean the logical, mathematical end. Yeah. Other questions? Um, yeah, there was one more thing about the. Oh yeah, so as you've seen from uh, Christopher going all over the material, um, the, the best way to, to prepare for the exam is to cover kind of a broader range of topics, not to specialize in one mm. very deeply, mm. but rather for kind of cover more, less deeply, yep. <laughs> right? So because of the nature of the exam, we kind of ask about everything a little bit. We don't go very deep into any of the areas. Uh, yeah, but then we be careful with this one as well, right? Because some questions are, of course, quite specific. They right? so the precision, yes, exactly. So some questions are kind of deep and you need to answer them. So that, that also uh, one aspect about the exam that um, there are questions which are um, uh, easy and there are questions which are hard. And it's natural that some of you will not know the answers for the hard questions, right? And you need to be kind of precise and you kind of read the question and then skip the hard ones, do all the easy ones first, then go back and kind of uh, do the harder ones and so on. You can do multiple passes through the exam because there is a lot of time. So from previous years, we know people were doing at least two or three passes through the exam, right? Uh, easy. Time it will not be an issue, I don't think. So, I mean, the, the thing is, that since you all have slightly different uh, backgrounds, interests, and so on, some aspects may that may appear hard for you uh, uh, may actually be easy for others, and conversely. And some yeah. questions that you find, oh, all the questions were easy, you may actually have answered some hard questions as well because you found them easy. Yeah. It's just very, very hard to, to consolidate all your different perspectives and the, the backgrounds you have, right? So. If you, for example, were to ask about networking, we could outright do that, but it would be very easy to figure out which crowd of you would be doing very well and who, who would not succeed that well, right? If you go into other areas, conversely. So we kind of need to find a nice middle ground. So the hard, easy one is more like for, 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 for very subjective, right? So that's what I'm saying. So don't worry. If you ask a question, you have not really a clue about how to answer this one. This will not be a deal breaker. Very likely not, right? So that's exactly. our idea. Yes, so exactly. Of capturing broadly what you understand. So before I, I, I go to the question, that, that I also have one answer for the earlier question, why we do electronic exam compared to essay exam. We actually ran a test where we ha had essay exams and we had few questions which were electronically marked. And the correlation between just grading on the electronic answers and what the essays were is almost one to one. So in terms of ranking students, there was no value in doing essays. Uh, so, and in fact, with the essays, the, the granularity of the yeah. histogram, or like we always pr produce the, uh, the histogram of how the students look like. Um, uh, yeah. No, they don't look like that. It's just their marks look like that. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> what he's saying is something like that. And then we have no, so. <laughs> so we have, you know, um, so if you see I'm drawing here some 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 curves basically. We often have something like this. There's a cluster of students that's really, really doing well or bad, depending on how you read this yeah. thing. Or conversely, perhaps I I mean yeah. the, the, the ideal one is of course something like this, right? So and we have a few students here that are really, really doing well, then we have a larger chunk of students sitting here that, you know, have covered the main idea and uh, understand and then a few ones that, that struggle a bit down here. So that's what he means when he talks about yeah, students. Yeah, yeah. Look that's like. right. So when we do the essays and we try to have this curve, it's kind of like very jumpy. It looks discretized. Be because uh, of the way the markers mark the essays, you kind of have kind of a step like, yeah, very chunky steps. Yeah. When you do the electronic one, the steps are very tiny. It's like almost smooth. Yeah. So each individual student kind of falls yeah kind of nicely along the lines, right? So with the chunkiness, we might have like, uh, you know, 10 students falling here with the essay ones. But if we do electronic one, we will kind of have bars like this. And we always have sample of one. So there is no chunkiness. It kind of like uh, differentiates the students kind of a more, uh, more precisely, right? So in fact, I mean, you may think as answering the exam that you have more, um, it's easier to write an essay and be kind of graded correctly, but the data suggests that it actually m doesn't matter, that the electronic one actually differentiates and kind of uh, makes a very smooth um, uh, picture like this. So, yeah, I, I feel um, writing essay for some students it's easier for some students, picking up the choices from multi-choice is easier. So again, it depends on the person who takes the exam. And I appreciate that there are different people uh, liking different things, right? Again, we yeah. still have some open methods. Exactly, open yeah. All right, so there was a question at the back. Uh, how many questions? Yeah, so we have about 50 questions. So the entire exam is about 50 questions, although it's a little bit hard to count because if you count 50 true-false questions, it's very different to 50 questions which have 10 multi-select answers, right? Which are much, much, much heavier. Like each of those lines is like a true-false question, right? Um, so in total, there is 50 questions, but uh, some of them are true-false, some of them are multi-select. So it kind of... Um, but but time will not be your problem. No. That's the only promise we can make. So we, so if you worry, oh, we run out of time, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, there was no case in which anyone said we didn't have enough time. So um, that that would be easy. Yeah, that's right. So from last years, we know most of the students do a pass th through 50 questions in about an hour. Mm. Um, so a three-hour exam allows them to do multiple passes. Yeah, so yeah. So you need to figure out if your gut feeling is the best one, the first one, or if your revisions. Because some people, in my experience, they actually refine too much in the end, right? So then yeah, that's right. Sometimes, sometimes your first take. Be I, I generally put weight on my initial take and really critically assess whether I want to change that afterwards. But that's yeah. something you need to figure out. That's metacognitive development. You need to figure out what works for you, how you tick, and so on. And you want to avoid, you know, getting your marks worse by actually accommodating by doing the too many rounds because it's inviting to say, "Ha, let's do five iterations, then I'm really fine." May not be right. So, um, but in any case, you should probably review once you once you answered the whole set. Review it. You know, did I tick the right boxes? Does it all make sense now? Looking at it again and so on. Perhaps some questions implicitly interrelate for you or not because some exactly. question may answer something that is actually not quite clear for you in another one because we can't really dissociate them 100%. So there may be an opportunity for you actually to, 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 to uh, you know, um, capitalize on that. But uh, over ex exhaustive uh, uh, reiteration can be challenging. So I'm, I'm not encouraging that explicitly, but it's your personal strategy. I don't think the exam is hard, really, right? No, I don't think it's hard. But it is hard to get 100%. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah. but in a sense that you, you, so you um, um, uh, passing this one should be... Exactly, so easy. it's not hard to pass. It's it's rather hard to get 100, uh, so don't expect to get 100. Um, if if someone gets 100, we feel like we kind of failed. 
It wouldn't make a difference anyway. Because yeah, it doesn't uh, make a difference. You, uh, we give you letter marks, right? Yeah. So if you uh, anything 90 above or something, yeah, exactly. it's uh, A anyway. So, um, but we use yeah, we can. That's the nice part of, again about those um, those exams as well that we can really figure out which in which cases did we get it wrong, or both in terms of what didn't we teach you right. Secondly, which questions are just stupid um, because that happens as well that we really sometimes have questions that don't make sense because people are answering all directions. That means either we haven't taught the concept properly or the questions just badly worded. Yeah, so, so that we, we do that. So if, if, for example, it turns out that none of your answers are correctly a, a question, exactly. we actually remove that question from marking, right? So because it doesn't make sense. Uh, so if like uh, the question is like skewed or people complain, oh yeah, this question was uh, ambiguous or something, then we sometimes do remove a question entirely from marking because it just doesn't make sense. Uh, or if the question was confusing and a lot of people answered it but got like a negative scores, we remove it as well. Um, so it, usually it's fine, like I, I wouldn't worry, like the exam is not very hard. Um, and you make use of the explanation field, right? So really, yeah. we, we read this. We read this for every student to check what you what you mark there. Don't, don't give us, you know, your life story, but just, you know, this is the question, this is how I took it. When, uh, when, when you feel you are unclear, if the question is clear, of course, don't comment on it. But just every time you have a question, just go back there, put it there. We will mark the exam with respect to your interpretation of that question, yeah. right? So, um, to, to, yeah, to some extent. Well, to, to some extent, yeah. if, you, if there's a question about AWS and you say, oh no, I like it to be a question about Docker, <laughs> um, that's probably not what we would accommodate. Yeah. But if you say we have, a, we have a certain bend on a question from, a, from your background, perhaps, right? So um, then, then we'll, we'll look at this. That's right. And one, one extra thing. So normally in the exam, we kind of required to expand the acronyms, but it kind of is subject dependent. In this course, knowing the acronyms is part of the knowledge. So if you are in the exam and you have a question what this acronym means, we will not means we will not answer it. It's part of the question, right? So acronyms you need to know the acronyms effectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean you, know, you, you cannot raise your hand and say, Oh, can uh, the lecturer expand this acronym? No. AWS <laughs> should be something I you mean, know, right? Yeah, so exactly. Uh, all that kind of stuff. I mean, go or, you know, spend for go. You, ma you may not understand the term. So if there is an English term that you don't understand or something okay. like this, sure, you can ask. But acronyms, are uh, no, we will not answer acronyms. Um, Good point. Yeah. There's not too many anyway. There are not too many, yeah? Uh, it's possible to practice on a previous exam. Yes, no, uh, in, in, yes, it's a good question. No, it's not possible to practice on the previous exams, but what I can do is I can put on the wiki a multi-choice test which looks kind of uh, like our questions, which we did uh, last year as well. So you can kind of test yourself on some of the online, but you can Google it yourself anyway, but I, I can put some uh, so you can try. And some questions are kind of like this, right? Um, yeah. And, uh, Yes, it is different. Yeah, we we did re we redone uh, the exam for this year. Um, so. Okay, so this exam is pretty different. There's always no overlap. I mean, you can only go as far, right? I mean, talk about IAS, yeah. talk about functional services, but there's always yeah, yeah. a certain overlap. So that's the uh, that's why uh, that would I think giving out the exam would give certain uh, considerable exposure to the current exam. I think the overlap is still yeah. considerable, like in the conceptually, right? Not that's the right. Of questions, but. Yeah, again, some questions I just recall, like you just need to kind of recall what was in the lecture. And some questions are more like you need to think. It wasn't directly in the lecture, you just were components and you kind of need to think, like, what yeah, makes sense? reason, yeah. yeah. So some questions are just for common sense, yeah? Uh, it was the previous exam also digital? Yes. Uh, on Inspira? Yes. That means technically, because I have a bunch of friends who are third year already done this course, I could just ask them, hey, mind printing out the previous exam because they're fully able to do so. They have access to the past exams? They have access to all yeah. previous Yeah, exams. so... I, I just feel like that's an unfair for most of the people here who doesn't have this... They don't have day. friends. Well... Yeah, I I think <laughs> they see the questions but not the answers, right? Hmm? They see the questions but not the answers. Yeah, 
they see the questions, but yes. not the answers. That's true. Well, you can see also the answers for, for uh, what they answer. Yeah, right. you can see the Yeah, yeah, but you yeah, wouldn't know if they answer correct or they're completely Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's unavoidable, like, uh, yeah. some things are kind of... Yeah, I, I, I'm just saying this so that the other people here, if you guys uploaded it, <coughs> these guys also have the possibility to get it. So why don't we just upload the current exam as well, then? Since we're on it. Yeah, okay. Um, we could put the 27. No. So different. Yeah. Different style and structure because we did some experimentation there. Yeah, I just talked yes. to this guy. There was some another question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I know it's already there and um, you can see the answers for cloud, but you can see if I have a thing or what. So I don't know if you can see oh, that. that and it went into the sphere and we saw, uh, I don't think anything from cloud is locked or something, but it's only. We, we need to figure that out. Let's talk. Yeah, about we, we let's, let's figure that out first. Yeah, we will figure it out. Yeah. I think putting your um, review question, the, 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 the one you just mentioned, with response to uh, Oscar is probably sensible for the wiki, right? So yeah. we figure that out. We need to look at this. I, I have no clue. So scary. Other questions? All right. So let's uh, let's wrap it up. Thank you very much.